Someone requested this video and, while it's not the Gulf War, there's the Gulf of Tonkin, so we can say that it technically still fits within the theme of the channel. Following the minor diplomatic incident, historians sometimes refer to as the Second World War, the Japanese government's Vietnamese puppet emperor abdicated, and a power vacuum opened up, filled in the north of Vietnam by an organisation called the Viet Minh. Its founder, Ho Chi Minh, was a Marxist-Leninist, and wanted to transform Vietnam into a communist state, independent of foreign government rule. From the end of the war in 1945 until 1954, Supported by the Chinese and Soviet governments, the Viet Minh fought against the French government, who'd occupied the area since the mid to late 1800s. The Chinese government, under the dictatorship led by Mao Zedong, had been the main supporters of Vietnamese independence. But that was going to change. The end of the war against the French government in 1954 ended with Vietnam being split into two nations. One, a Marxist-Leninist communist dictatorship, one, a fascistic, capitalist dictatorship. The Chinese government wanted to exert its influence over the new North Vietnamese government and the mainland Southeast Asian region more generally, and used the peace conference in Geneva, Switzerland, to begin this. In order to undermine the North Vietnamese government's ability to hold much sway over the region in place of themselves, the Chinese government made it clear to the North Vietnamese government delegation that they wouldn't tolerate Viet Minh forces in Laos and Cambodia, and publicly declared that the two countries' government's delegations should be regarded at the conference as neutral nations, whose situations should be dealt with separately to the Vietnamese governments. The North Vietnamese government, not exactly able to disagree with its most prominent base of support, caved in and announced that they would withdraw their forces. This also meant removing any chance to exert a lot of control over Cambodia's and Laos's governments. The Chinese government, Conscious not to allow the new North Vietnamese government to be too strong, also said to the French government that they'd be willing to agree to recognise the partitioning of Vietnam into two states. The North Vietnamese government, however, was determined to unify with the South, and in 1955, a year after the peace conference, a war broke out between the North and South's governments. The North's government was supported by the Chinese and Soviet governments, and the South by the US government. Around this time, political differences between the Soviet and Chinese regimes would give the North Vietnamese regime the chance to be less under the thumb of the Chinese leader Mao Zedong. In 1953, the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin, died, which put a huge dent in Soviet-Chinese government relations. It's too big a subject to get into here, but ideological differences between the two led to a split in their alliance during the late 1950s and early 1960s, and even culminated in a short border war between them in 1969. The Cold War, which now existed between the Soviet and Chinese governments, put the North Vietnamese government in an advantageous position, as both sought to help them with their interests to get them on their own side. Because the North's government was engaged against the US government and its allies in the Vietnam War, the jockeying for allyship from the Soviet and Chinese governments came in the form of economic and military assistance to try to show one's own side as the closer ally. The one thing that the Chinese government didn't want was an oppositional regime on its southern border, which could exert its influence over the rest of mainland Southeast Asia, so to them it was imperative that they, and not the Soviets, have the most control over the North Vietnamese government's internal politics and foreign policy. However, Mao's policy was a bit contradictory. On the one hand, he was looking to fund a war effort against the US government, and, on the other, he was looking to become closer to the US government. Since the split with the Soviet government, the Chinese government was looking to get more allies to counterbalance the threat posed by the regime in Moscow. It was kind of ironic that the split began in part because Mao saw Khrushchev as too soft on the US government, and now, because of the split, Mao wanted better relations with them. The US government wanted this too, with the Secretary of State at the time in 1969 saying that if moves were made to improve relations with the Chinese government, then we may be able eventually to exert some influence on the Chinese government in a direction more favourable to our own interests. But still, the Chinese regime wanted to keep the North Vietnamese government on their side, and so, even though they were looking to become more friendly with the US government, their support for a war against its own forces ramped up in the early 1970s, 
It's been argued that this was to placate the North Vietnamese government about the apparent contradictions in claiming to oppose US government imperialism and yet becoming more friendly with them, so as to stop a Soviet government-aligned regime from being on their southern border. From 1971 to 1973, the Chinese government provided the North Vietnamese government with 9 billion yuan in support. However, there were three major problems for the Chinese government. The first was that the policy of providing aid to the North Vietnamese government was economically unsustainable. The second was that the North Vietnamese government was extremely angry about the Chinese government getting closer to the US government at a time when they were literally at war with them. And the third was Cambodia's government. Okay, the first thing. Mao had tried to massively and swiftly increase the industrialization and agricultural production of China, as well as further develop the nation into a Marxist-Leninist society from the 1950s to the 1960s in a policy known as the Great Leap Forward. For numerous reasons, such as the failure of government planning and, frankly, delusional quotas for grain which couldn't be produced and went to urban areas far more than to rural areas, the policy led to the worst recorded famine in human history and the deaths of up to 30 million people. In order to strengthen his own rule after this disaster, Mao ordered what is known as the Cultural Revolution, a drive to purge his political enemies and instill a cult of personality, with the justification of protecting Maoist communism from capitalists and traditionalists. This resulted in the deaths of perhaps tens of millions of people. Mao's policies severely weakened the Chinese economy, but he was still determined to fund the North Vietnamese government in order to keep them from allying closer with the Soviet government. In the early 1970s, Mao and the Chinese premier, Zhu Enlai, were under pressure to begin cutting foreign aid in order to try to save more money, but for Mao, it was too important a policy to give up on until good relations with the US government were secured. But the North Vietnamese government wasn't blind to what was happening, and weren't going to be idle about it. They desperately needed aid to fight their war, and support their own economy. The Chinese government was struggling to give as much support as the North Vietnamese government wanted, or had been promised, and the latter would try to use closer relations with the Soviet government as a method to get as much of that support from Mao as they could. If the Chinese government couldn't give them the support they needed, then they would ask the Chinese government to allow the Soviet government to support them instead, with the aid transiting through China. This is around where the second major problem for the Chinese regime comes in. The North Vietnamese government reaction to closer ties with the US government. In 1972, the US President Richard Nixon visited Beijing and publicly shook hands with the Chinese Premier Zhu Enlai. To the North Vietnamese government, this was little more than betrayal. They saw the Chinese government's economic and military assistance as a front, with the real policy being to keep Vietnam divided so that it, the Chinese government, could rule as regional hegemon. In a way, they weren't wrong. The Chinese government was looking to safeguard their interests, which included being able to exert power over spheres of influence like mainland Southeast Asia. When relations with the US government were established, the North Vietnamese government was no longer as useful to the Chinese government, and so they drastically began to cut aid between 1972 and 1975, feeling more secure now against the threat posed by the Soviet government. This aid was cut most drastically after an attempted peace treaty to the Vietnam War, during the negotiations for which the Chinese government used the vital aid as a tool to pressure the North Vietnamese government into signing. The lack of sufficient economic support was putting a huge strain on the North Vietnamese government's ability to wage the war and the chances for economic reconstruction post-war. So when, in 1975, a North Vietnamese military offensive swept through the South and captured Saigon, leading to the dissolution of South Vietnam and unification with the North, and the aid was cut even more drastically, the Vietnamese government felt that their best bet now would be to go fully over towards the Soviet government. This decision was strengthened by the corresponding increase in support for the communist regime under Pol Pot in Cambodia by the Chinese government. During the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese military and Viet Cong militia used Cambodia as a base for supply routes and things like that. A civil war began in Cambodia in 1968, and in 1970, a US government-backed coup deposed the king, who had previously been an ally to the Chinese government, and, to a degree, the North Vietnamese government. The Chinese government was now supporting a group called the Khmer Rouge against the new government, 
and the Khmer Rouge were more closely allied politically with Mao rather than the Soviet or North Vietnamese governments. The Khmer Rouge won the civil war in 1975. Pol Pot, the new dictator, believed that the North Vietnamese government was looking to exert their influence over Cambodian government affairs, and the Chinese government encouraged them to resist Vietnamese government attempts to become the hegemon of mainland Southeast Asia. The Cambodian dictatorship thus began purging ethnic Vietnamese from the ranks of the government and the military, and fighting with Vietnamese forces along the border from 1975. There was also fighting between the Chinese and Vietnamese governments along their border. Pol Pot felt even more secure in continuing these skirmishes when he signed a military aid pact with the Chinese government in 1977. Talks between the Chinese and Vietnamese governments to defuse tensions went nowhere, though at this time the Chinese government was funding an insurgency inside Vietnam against the government, while thousands of ethnic Chinese fled Vietnam to China due to government policies targeting their wealth leading to accusations against the Vietnamese government of anti-Chinese sentiments and against the Chinese government of espionage. Then, in 1978, amid a wider genocide campaign launched by Pol Pot, a Cambodian military raid was launched into Vietnam to murder a nearby town. This, as well as the Khmer Rouge regime's other actions, led the Vietnamese government to decide that they should embark on a mission of regime change in Cambodia. Meanwhile, in China, the dictatorship was also planning to go to war, mainly in response to the repeated border skirmishes with the Vietnamese military. In September of 1978, a Chinese Army General Staff Department meeting took place about the matter. Quite quickly, however, the conversation shifted following new intelligence reports about a possible Vietnamese government invasion of Cambodia in the very near future. The plans for any Chinese military action moved from ideas about a small-scale cross-border operation to something which would send a strong message to the Vietnamese government and have the ability to impact the regional power balance struggle. The consequences of a war were not going to be smooth, however, least of all because of the international backlash. In November, de facto Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping was going to be visiting regional governments, and among other things, he would use his time there to gain support for Chinese military action against the Vietnamese government, styling it as a necessary measure against an expansionist regime. He declared that any action being taken against the Vietnamese government would entirely depend on their own action against the Cambodian government. Around this time, another high-level Chinese military meeting took place, talking more about how a war against the Vietnamese government should play out, with all major towns and military installations across the border to be targeted. The actual decision to go to war to end the threat to the Cambodian government and China's borders was taken in early December, with the operation planned for early January. The plan was that the Chinese military forces would strike 30 miles into Vietnam, envelop and destroy Vietnamese forces in a swift war of movement, and withdraw back to China. In all, it would last two weeks, a short, limited war aimed at maintaining the status quo regional balance of power ending border skirmishes, and keeping the Soviet government's influence from spreading in mainland Southeast Asia through the Vietnamese government. There were two major concerns about the operation. The first was the state of the Chinese military. This was to be their biggest military operation since the Korean War in the early 1950s. Their other wars since then were much smaller by comparison, and many of the soldiers had no combat experience. Plus, the war would see two different commanders acting totally independent of each other, with little coordination planned to take place. The other major concern for the government, though, was the scope of the war spreading. Most troubling was the fact that the Vietnamese and Soviet governments had very recently signed a treaty of friendship together, and so, considering the fighting between the Chinese and Soviet governments in 1969, in addition to the many Soviet divisions stationed near the Chinese border, it wouldn't be impossible for the Soviet leader to decide to militarily assist his Vietnamese government allies. It was hoped, though, that the planned operation was too limited in scope for the Soviet government to feel compelled to intervene. But that didn't stop precautions being taken. Local military units were placed on high alert, and civilians would be evacuated. Then, in December 1978, the Vietnamese army invaded Cambodia. Pol Pot's regime was toppled by early January 1979. Suddenly, the Chinese government's position was dramatically changed. The Vietnamese government was now able to properly challenge them for hegemony over mainland Southeast Asia, 
and their main ally in the region was now exiled in Thailand, and part of their southern border was now run by a Soviet government allied regime. At a meeting at the turn of the year, the necessity of war for the Chinese government's perspective was redeclared. The war would begin as planned in early January, and as a pre-war measure, the Deputy Chief of Staff and General Logistics Department Director inspected the troops preparing to invade Vietnam. They weren't filled with confidence, and said that the military would need another month before it would be ready to go. The war was then rescheduled for mid-February 1979, and the objectives were slightly changed to limit the operation further so as to reduce the chance of the war spinning out of the government's control. In January, Deng Xiaoping visited the US and concluded the diplomatic normalisation efforts that had begun in the early 70s. One of the leading Chinese government officials declared in a meeting with the US Vice President that the normalization of Sino-US relations is not only in conformity with the aspirations and interests of the Chinese and American peoples, but will also certainly play a role in combating the expansion and aggression of hegemonism. Deng himself declared that the Vietnamese government were the Cubans of the Orient, and that if you don't teach them some necessary lessons, it just won't do. However, he was careful to make it publicly known that his upcoming action would be nothing more than limited. It wasn't even clear if the US government, who despite closer ties were by no means close friends but more like rivals who'd agreed to peacefully coexist, would try to get something out of an invasion of Vietnam, but the Soviet government was the bigger concern. After the invasion was launched on February 17th, public government announcements were made to convince the Soviet government not to intervene. On the 26th, Deng explained that our objective is a limited one, that is, to teach the Vietnamese government that they could not run about as much as they desired, and a few days later explicitly said that there was no intention to capture Hanoi. The conflict was not even labelled as a war, but as a self-defensive counter-attack. The number of troops involved in the initial invasion differs depending on the sources I found, anything from 75,000 to the more often cited over 300,000 in total, both invading and in reserve, as well as over 200,000 civilian volunteers and militia in Guangxi province alone. Facing them were 120 to 160,000 Vietnamese soldiers and militia. The Chinese military had intended to invade with a numerical superiority of 8 to 1, but because of the large amount of Vietnamese militia, it was more like 2 to 1 in reality. The Chinese military's plan was quite simple. Encircle and destroy Vietnamese divisions at Cao Bang and Lao Cai, and another attack to capture Dong Dang to keep the Vietnamese government guessing as to the main focus of the offensive. The town of Lang Song would then be captured, while another enemy division would be destroyed in Sa Pa. The Chinese Air Force would not take part, for fear that it would lead to an escalation of the conflict, and their main role was simply to be present and ready at the border to deter any actions by the Vietnamese Air Force. At first, the Vietnamese government was caught by surprise, not having believed that the Chinese government would ever actually attack them. Their directive was simply to put up as much improvised resistance as possible until a more formidable defence could be established, and they requested immediate assistance from the Soviet government. Soviet military advisers suggested that regular troops be airlifted from Cambodia to Vietnam to assist, but the Vietnamese government was slow to make decisions. Their best troops were already deployed in another country, and they didn't know the exact target of the Chinese government's operations. But they did believe that, despite the initial setbacks, this wasn't going to be a disaster. For one thing, they could rely on the Chinese government's attempts to keep the Soviet government out of the war with their public announcements to tell them what Deng Xiaoping was planning. He said it wouldn't be Hanoi, and that it would only be a short operation. The Vietnamese government also felt that the Chinese military, though large in numbers, would be less adept at fighting than their own troops and militia. Moreover, because the Chinese military was announcing that the conflict was to be limited in scope and duration, that meant the Vietnamese government wouldn't have to withdraw its forces from Cambodia and could rely mostly on local militia to hold the offensive back. Considering that forcing a withdrawal from Cambodia was one of the Chinese government's aims, that wasn't exactly a good start. Moreover, the offensive was not going as swiftly as planned. The regional geography and poor logistical chains of the Chinese military slowed the pace, as did a lack of air power. The objectives for the first day weren't met, and it wasn't until day three that Cao Bang was captured. 
Vietnamese forces then melted into rural and urban areas to carry out hit-and-run attacks, which delayed Chinese forces even more. By the start of March, Lang Song, one of the main operational objectives, had not yet been captured. The Chinese government pushed for it to be taken, which would open the way to Hanoi. In other words, a message to the Vietnamese government that they should halt their attempts to wrest regional hegemonism from the Chinese government or face the consequences. It was finally captured on March 5th, and the Chinese government almost immediately announced a withdrawal from Vietnam when they heard the news, claiming that they had won the war and achieved their goals. Three provincial capitals had been occupied, and according to Chinese government estimates, they'd inflicted almost 50 to 60 thousand casualties on the Vietnamese army and militia. No official number actually exists, however, and it's likely that this number is both inaccurate and inflated. Conversely, the Vietnamese government declared that they'd inflicted 42,000 casualties on the invaders. At first, the Chinese government declared that they'd actually taken less than half as many. In the United States, Pentagon analysts guessed from the Chinese government's claim that they'd lost 5,000 or so dead. The latter also tried to convince the US government that most of their troops were frontier troops rather than army regulars who were defending their homes from the Vietnamese military. That's mostly untrue, however. In later years, studies would show that the Chinese military had indeed suffered over 20,000 casualties, over 7% of their total force, which can partly be explained, as one Chinese historian put it, by the military command considering casualty is to be a relatively unimportant criterion for weighing military success, as long as they believe the overall strategic situation was in their grasp. Whether or not the war is a victory is mixed. The occupation of Cambodia would continue, and the dual threat from the Soviet and Vietnamese government influence remained, though it was certainly diminished. It would later be argued that the war did indeed force an end to the occupation of Cambodia by being part of a wider strategy of attrition against the Vietnamese government, but it was much more than this which forced them to withdraw their occupation forces, or any moves solely by the Chinese government. It was simply too much of an economic drain and a diplomatic nightmare for the Vietnamese government, in large part because of the insurgency being waged against them in Cambodia itself, which ate up much of the national budget to combat. At least, from the Chinese government's perspective, the Vietnamese government's attempts to further expand its power over mainland Southeast Asia ceased after the war, as it compounded many of the other issues facing the Vietnamese governments. Border skirmishes with the Vietnamese military would continue over the next decade as part of the general strategy of containment, and the lessons of the war would, in large part, help lead to modernization and reform of the Chinese military. In 1989, the Vietnamese government, under intense internal and external pressures, finally completed withdrawing its last forces from Cambodia. <laughs>